any specific pro program in particular, but if there's an, an overall way that you kind of educate and share knowledge, just substitute program with that kind of idea. Like you did mention, um, it's more of a healing based module as opposed to like an education facility. But what I do is um, land based learning and healing opportunities. My understanding of being an Ishnabe Kwe is to understand and learn about the gifts that I was given by Creator mm -hmm. and to use those when teaching others and generally early infancy to even elder stage of life people have come to access education whether it be um, what time of year the animals are moving about ceremonies what type of uh, wood is best to use in certain situations, for example, for a fire. A lot of times people come to me to understand about grief and loss and where that's stored in our bodies and how do we help address what caused that and work on healing um, venues to be able to live life to our fullest potential. Part of the responsibility that I was given as Nishinaabe Kwe is that the information that I've been handed down to me from my elders or that I've learnt from being out on the land is that information isn't mine, you know. There's people that come and ask me to share with them and to teach or educate some of the things that I've learnt. And a lot of times it's just being a witness to that other person's own search for the answer or mm -hmm. search for that education you know I'm just like a tool to help guide them to learn what it is that they're trying to find out I find that from a personal perspective when I look at my oldest child versus my youngest child and the learning and education that they've done through following our way of life and what I was shown or taught by our elders is uh the youngest one at a quicker age has picked up a, a greater sense of well-being and understanding and learns much more rapidly to the natural law as opposed to what they teach perhaps in kindergarten. But that took 18 years since the first child, whereas I was more focused on sending them to school to follow that Western education system. Mm -hmm. But that's how long I've been at school, is at least 18 years learning about this way of life and how important it is and how fundamental it is to our core beings. And I've, se and I've seen the changes. So you kind of touched on the ages. Mm -hmm. Well, not really their age, but a grouping of people. Mm -hmm. So what, what ages? Would you have influence on, I guess? Um, at various times in the past 20 years, it's, uh, it's changed according to need. Because right now, a lot of Indigenous people and what's current or, or popular, for lack of a better word, affects different ages. So I did a lot of work with elders at one point when the Western world was focusing on the residential schools, right? Because, of course, they would have been older. Now, there is... I've worked with uh, youth aged 14 to probably 20 when they were trying to discover who they were, what the current education system couldn't or wouldn't teach because there's no legislation that says they must learn who they are. So they would come away from the big city to find out, to be grounded, to find out who, who they were and began searching, whether it be going on um, ceremony or passing the tobacco just to ask for clarification on things that they might have already heard. And very early on, children two and a half to six years old. And I think that one was 
probably the most reciprocal where these children would come and want to know and expect to be taught and sometimes they would have questions that I didn't know but by the end of that week we had learnt together so there's no uh, somebody's greater than somebody else regardless of age mm -hmm. nice so when when this learning or sharing occurs like how would you describe your approach uh, there's there's definitely challenges when you uh, when you ask questions in that context mm -hmm. because um, I was taught and shown an old way whereas nowadays you see um, people posting maybe on social media or sending out flyers or having their own businesses towards what they do um, I don't follow that what I do follow is being out there and active in my community and doing the things that I know that I'm responsible to do and people hearing about that and knowing that at any time of the day or night that they would be able to come to where I am or call if they uh, needed that help or wanted to learn. There's some things that we already know that happens. It's not, um, you're not going to find it written in a textbook. It's we know when the moon, full, the moon is full, so there's something we do around that time. We know when the sap water starts to run, there's something we do around that time. We know when our Thunderbird ceremonies are, we know what to do around that time. Mm -hmm. So there's no real adver advertising for that. Mm -hmm. And you can't ever advertise grief. Like one of the things I do educate on is preparing for that time when people travel through that western doorway. Mm -hmm. We don't we don't know when that time is gonna be. But the community at large knows that if they want to learn what do we do, how are things gonna go, they know that they can come and approach and ask. When when you speak about the full moon or the sap running kind of moments where you would share where you would be sharing with somebody? Is there kind of a flow that you've kind of created to talk about these things that you 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 yourself have kind of put together through time? It changes. Like I can only share how I received things from my elders or how I received things through a vision or a creator. And depending on who it is that's coming to ask, this is where sometimes there's that connection of spirit to spirit as opposed to uh, educator and student, is there's some people that need to have a direct, concrete, step-by-step -step approach. And then there's some people that just need to kind of move like water, slow and up and down. But when it comes to teaching or educating, it's really getting to know those people that you are with and understanding their way of learning. There's somebody that had come once and asked, and they're deaf. So trying to find a way to communicate and educate with that person took getting to know that person and seeing how, what education model would work best so that they were receptive to learning and felt comfortable and asking the, the, the questions. For clarification for me, do you work with Indigenous education? As, your, as part of your vocabulary, or do you prefer to name something else? Um, I, I'm having a real hard time trying to answer these questions in the Western format, because a lot of what I do is in that Western format, and I don't know how well you'd be able to translate some of the words that I would say in Nishnami Moon. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sure. <Yeah>. But <clears throat> um, I try, whenever possible, not to use that language and that wording, educator, and all the all of those words from that language that was brought here. 
right? I, I like using things like the Mazuin, our, our, our good life, right? And where did we get that good life, right? There, there's teachings in history and history oral, of oral tradition of how we received this information and how we shared it and how we passed it down. So to call it something, I mean, to answer your questions, I'm trying to blend the Western vocabulary and trying to explain our, our Bermudsu and our way of life, and it's not always simple. And perhaps maybe that's something that these researchers that are doing this program can look at, how difficult it is to be in both worlds and to answer a set of specific questions, but based from a Western model. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you say our way of life, what are you talking about? The two-legged race. I can't limit it to the red race, the yellow race, the white race, the black. There was four colors of man on that spirit wheel. And there was the two-legged, the four-legged swimmers. Mm -hmm. So when I say our, I'm inclusive of that two-legged race. We have a responsibility from whatever part of the world we are to learn about who we are and honor that agreement or commitment that we made with our Creator or God or and to live that way and coexist amongst each other peacefully as equals. Sure, perfect. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I just... Uh, when I'm asking questions, it's helpful for me to know like, do I keep saying Indigenous education blah, 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 or when we're talking about our programs, um, just because I, like, we know each other. Mm -hmm. I know who the R is you're talking about, mm -hmm. but the people in Saskatchewan, Cree folk or Lakota folk, they won't know right. what it is you're talking about when you say our, our. Right. Right? So, just for that clarity, like, there's, um... I imagine they'll appreciate that. <laughs> because, like, some of the other points that we come across, like, some, some folks have got frustrated because that Indigenous word keeps coming up as opposed to, well, you're, you're talking to me. Right? You're talking to all my ancestors, too. Yeah. You know? Well, I'll share it's with not, you. It's not just Indigenous folk. It's, like, actual Anishinaabek folk you're talking to, you know? So, like, address me in that in that. Yeah. In that way and that kind of stuff, you know. It's that Western influence trying to label us, whether it be Indian, Indian Act, Native, Aboriginal, now it's Indigenous, mm. right? That, that other side, the Western base still don't understand. But my five-year-old, he understands. Right. Because he told his brother today when he said, oh yeah, we're Nish. My five-year-old reminded my older son, we're not Nish. You have to say the word properly. We are Anishinaabe. Nice. And each syllable means something and talks about who we are. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. It's, it's neat. It's neat because that really flows into like one of the sub questions. The question one is like, how do you know what you do is successful? You know, and I think that's a good example one of many that you might be able to share, you know, but yeah, yeah like just in terms of just that, that idea of the programs or the ways you're a part of and how you, how you get to share and kind of express knowledge as, as we go, uh, down this journey. Um, what other ways can you kind of measure success and you know, what it is that you do? Well, I know that every time I say I'm going to take a break from this and go on a holiday, it never happens. I always get a call. Mm. And then I'm reminded about the commitment that I made with the Creator before I came down here. Once I became conscious of, and once I became aware of what my responsibilities were and what my gifts were, mm -hmm. I am bound by that. It's okay to sometimes say no to people, but then I'm the one that has to sit there and think about the, uh-oh, are they okay? What if? What if? So that's one way, is knowing that even when I want to check out for a while, there are still individuals that will seek out because either they've come before, or they've heard from somebody else, or just know that whatever it is that I share or teach or help with is helping, I would imagine. Right, yeah. yeah. 
um, like you said the point before, seeing our little people pick up what it is that I do or what we do and carry that and teach others, but also have that courage and bravery to mm. s use that voice to speak out and say something that reminds me that, yes, that this uh, approach, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. it, it is working. Can I look you up in some directory and be like, I'm looking for this kind of knowledge to be shared with me. Would I, would I see your name somewhere or? No, you no. might see my name in an article that I was interviewed for on a personal nature, but you won't see, like you wouldn't be able to look me out. If you wanted to know, generally what happens is people get together and they're talking about, hey, do you know anybody that can... And word of mouth would usually say, well, actually, you know what? This person might be able to help you mm. understand. Yeah. Right? Or learn. Right? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I think, too, then, that, that would be another kind of measure of success, too, I guess. Not, not really success, but more just a measure of... Yeah, like if I'm looking for this kind of sharing to happen, mm -hmm. you know, you kind of have an establish a reputation and that could be another measure of success in quotations, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't be that successful if people weren't talking oh, about right. you, right? <laughs> reputation, oh my goodness. <laughs> what does that even mean? <laughs> Yeah, like so, some of these other questions, uh, they talk about, like you, like you were saying, like very Western kind of approach, like how how is it evaluated? What you do, what feedback do you receive? So you kind of talk to that a little bit, like the feedback you would receive would be from other people recommending you. I think the only story I can share that comes to mind clearly, mm -hmm. about evaluation, would be being at a actual licensed business amongst a group of women accessing cultural, traditional services, having that program suddenly cancelled, but having a good majority of that group of women decide that they're going to come and visit me instead to mm. get what they need. Yeah. Because that could, that program was no longer running, but they knew that they felt safe and they knew that there was something that they could learn about working on within themselves mm -hmm. if they had come to see me. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that, for sure. Um, it's funny... <laughs> It's kind of funny how this this rolls up because frequently I, I I've experienced like where people end. It's like a good kind of segue into the next kind of question because this one this one talks about like we're still under question one by the way. <laughs> <laughs> question one e six because they they give you kind of prompting kind of questions right to keep the flow going. And uh, this one just talks about what challenges have you faced when doing what you do and how have you overcome them to make what you do successful? Well, challenges. Uh, I've come to understand that everything happens for a reason. So if something were set up to happen and then all of a sudden it didn't happen, there's a reason why it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. It's just the natural law of things. It just wasn't time, or people weren't ready, or I had something still to learn, or mm -hmm. the only barrier that I can think of this one time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was working for a well known organization, and I'd worked there for a few years, and youth were coming to see me, and you saw a success rate with the way that they had transitioned through using the services. And then it came for my evaluation. And at that point, 
the human resource department realized that I did not have a degree in social work, mm -hmm. which of course created a whole uh, series of events, and I ended up leaving that organization because I didn't have that piece of Western paper, even though out of the five workers that worked in that department, the turnover rate and the success stories came from my end of the office, so mm -hmm. to speak, to the point where I'm still in contact with a few of those youth today who are now young adults mm -hmm. because they knew that just because they didn't work there anymore, we had started this um, growth process of learning together and <clears throat> whatnot. And, but yeah, that's the only barrier I've noticed is not having that westernized Western degree. Right. And it affecting so many lives. Yeah. Right, right, right. Versus the lived experience and being a knowledge keeper and a ceremony maker. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't recognized in that Western world. What is, and this, this is what I was talking about earlier, what is Indigenous education to you, right? <laughs> what we had said we would talk about what is uh, Anishinaabek education. Well, <laughs> Anishinaabek education, I guess, if I had to define it, mm -hmm. it for Western terminology, I'd say uh, it's more of a spiritual sense of education because our education begins before we even come down here. And we sit up in spirit world and there's things that happen up there that we become to understand. And then we make our ways down here. So... For the Western people, they understand about birth and life. So we're already born with the tools to learn, the tools to share, the tools to teach. Um, but what we have noticed as far as Anishinaabek learning is, the more influence that other societies, like the Western society for an example, has had with... trying to commit genocide on our people or the 60s scoop to take us away from who we are and our family how much of a detrimental effect it's had in that connection to spirit therefore stopping our learning progress or making it difficult to continue with our learning mm -hmm. right um, we like to use or I like to use that term a lot the mad swim that good life what does that mean? If you break down the word, it would mean something <clears throat> probably more specific. But to me, um, it is having a human experience. And our entire human experience is a learning journey. And while we're learning, we're also teaching the ones that follow after us or the ones that are around us. And we just basically want to be a good human being. You know, uh, <clears throat> the new the new age terminologies give us that tool called the seven grandfathers. Um, we didn't have that tool way back when. We didn't call it that. But I'll make reference to that about having the respect for our life, right? Having having the love for ourselves, those things around us, speaking our truth through honesty, having the courage and bravery to accept things for what they are, or maybe having to speak out about certain things. One of the key elements to Anishinaabe learning is following those things that were given to us. So we were already born into a clan and we were given a name and that name would help us in life about who we are. So our learning started as soon as we came into this world, like I said before, before that even, right when we sat in spirit world with Creator. we learn things up there before coming down. We had to choose if we were going to come down and choose who our parents were. And I could talk forever and not talk forever. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm getting barriers here when I'm trying to, to speak because some of these things um, aren't meant for that general population that might have access to the results of this research. Mm-hmm. So trying to keep it as, as vague as possible, but to give enough information to give 
the person that might be reading or hearing this and understanding about what our Anishinaabe education or law system looked like. It was always there. It's not something that was created like the Western people that said you must go to school when you're six years old and go to kindergarten mm. and graduate until and then go on to college and then university and, and now you're done and now you're a functioning community member. We were given that birthright. We had roles and responsibilities from the moment we came down here. Mm. And we always knew what that was and we understood that our learning was a lifetime. Whether we only live to be six or whether we live to be 94, mm -hmm. it was a continual learning and sharing and teaching. Are, are there other new age technologies out there that you can pinpoint? I don't know about pinpointing because there wasn't, for whatever reason, that understanding of respect about our ways, or Anishinaabe ways, and a lot of things were openly shared instead of protected. Um, it's been picked up by not only Anishinaabe, but other societies, and they try to claim and make it their own, and take these shortcuts to the long process that it sometimes took to be able to understand and learn and, and teach. You, you were able to talk about specifically like the grandfather teachings and, and how that could, be, that could be recognized as a new age technology. Mm -hmm. Is there another something that uh, carries that yeah. same kind of weight? <laughs> On the border of upsetting a few people, <laughs> <laughs> I have no real knowledge. Well, I, I can't openly understand and accept what I've been taught about things like the ribbon shirt and the ribbon skirt, because we didn't have that. And I know that with times are changing, and this movement, whether it be feminist movement, or whether it be um, non-feminist movement, people wanting to understand and promote who they were, and this type of dress may have been created to help reawaken and reinstill, but it wasn't there before. Before we had what we had, right? This is something that's new, and it's not a bad thing, but personally, if I was going to work with somebody, I would take it a further step and take them back before that dress came. And I sew, and I make ribbon skirts. But I've been taught that I have to try and share what I've received so far in, in, in the best way possible, but to kind of stick with the guidelines of what was given because our ancestors, and they did speak of a time where there'd be this, this confusion, and a lot of it might set some of us back, whereas some of us, for example, that one child the story I told you about might hold on to that older way instead of the, um, lack of a better word, washed out version of what it's like to be a Anishinaabe. Nice. No, no, that's great. Thank you, Judge. For giving us a couple of examples to work with. Some of the questions for, for Anishinaabe education in terms of prompting, they talk about language, how language is, is a part of Anishinaabe education. So what is the importance then of, of language? Uh, language is everything. The language that we spoke breathed spirit, mm -hmm. breathed life into what it was we were saying. There was an understanding for everything in our language, even how we break down the words, because it talks about mm -hmm. and tells a story and it was easier for us to understand that original instruction given to us by mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And it's all in our language. And the one thing that the um, <clears throat> Western society uh, will predominantly say that they're the white race, they had a certain gift. And, you know, it'd be good if they remembered what that gift was and started to nurture that. 
and uh, allow us, or we're still doing it, is re-picking up, revitalizing our language, because some of us did lose it. Mm. Uh, I'm one person who lost my language because of a head injury, and I've had to go back and pick it back up. But when I have to explain things, like at the beginning of this interview, trying to express the true intention of my answers and what's inside my heart it is difficult when I have to use this Western language because the words aren't the same. Mm -hmm. there, it's almost like there's no life in this language that those people created, whereas in our language, it, it, was, it was sacred. Everything was sacred because, like I said, there was spirit in it. It breathed life. It, it told us what we needed to know in just one word, two words. They're really long words, mind you. <laughs> but when you took the time to... You knew what it was. Yeah. You know? And to a lot of people, they think it's difficult, but it's not. It was actually quite literal. Like, the word for coffee basically says, this is hot black water. Mm -hmm. Right? That, that's so simple. It's just the influence of the Western society and the way that some of us think has made it difficult for ourselves to reconnect to the simpleness of the life that's in our language. Mm. And speaking about that piece of paper, that Western piece of paper, uh, reflecting on uh, the importance of Indigenous or Anishinaabeg education and a link to someone's future career choice. The preparation needed to be able to you talked about living in both worlds. Mm -hmm. For Anishinaabeg education, how, how, how do you think our youth are being prepared for living in those, those two worlds? There isn't very much happening. There has been changes that I've seen from 20 years ago to today where people are starting to wake up and nurture and foster education or ways of life with, within our, our youth. I know that our ancestors fought for, when they created the Indian Act, for education to always be covered. Because our elders knew that we would have to pick up the tools from that other nation to be able to meet them at the same level at times when we came together. So there's definitely the pros to learning and getting that white piece of paper but it should never come at the cost of forgetting who we are and because there's been so much focus on you have to go to school you have to do this you have to you know for our youth uh, a lot of them are still recovering from historical things that's happened to our families right whether it be the residential school 60 scoop um, drug and alcohol abuse that they're still trying to find themselves because their, and their, their parents or their grandparents lost that, so they never received that. And the quick fix that I see happening is um, funding-based models where, okay, there's money being given to pay for education or to pay for drug and alcohol or to pay for... But there isn't enough communication between... The ones that want to help these youth, or the youth that want to help themselves, with tapping into going out on a limb, individuals like myself, who still honor that tobacco, like, don't pay me to help you help yourself, mm. right? Um, there, isn't, there isn't enough of support out there right now for people, for, for our youth to be able to access and finding out that big chunk of them that is missing but yet they're still dictated to about, well, you have to do this and you have to do that. Mm -hmm. And if you want to go to school, you have to do this. But there isn't enough tapping into having them being able to access and coming to understand who they are. That's definitely a big chunk of it, right? Yeah. Well, Western society yeah. taught us that those people don't have a voice. But, I mean, our, in Nishnabe, we believe everyone has a voice. They're all teachers to us. But following that module for so long, yeah. they're taught not to, they don't have a voice. It's more of a dictatorship. You have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't 
think you would consider yourself an elder yet. More of a knowledge holder, perhaps. I'm not sure. But uh, with that kind of hat on, you're definitely involved in passing on knowledge from one generation to another. Are there, are there things that you want to make sure are passed on, right? Are there, are there things that really, really need to have a focus on? A, to prepare those youth for stepping out into the world, you know, um, to get that Western education and find that balance that we're all looking for, right? So are, are, there, are there certain stories or, or teachings that you feel like you have to make sure are passed on? I'll start with that word, elder. Mm -hmm. Our language has different words. And you're right. I don't care if I live to be 20, uh, 200 years old. <laughs> I will never call myself that because that is not our language. We have our language and it speaks about what our roles are as people. Um... <clears throat> If there's something I want to pass down, I think I'm doing it already, mm. and I continue to do it, and it starts within the home first, and it starts with your immediate family, your children, your grandchildren, to educate them, or to teach them, or to listen to what they have to teach us from the very beginning. And what and once you are following that, then there's a circle outside that that could involve your extended family or another circle outside of that that could that involve your community, right? But what am I doing is living as best as I can to how I may have been instructed to live and that includes passing it down to my children, right? Who hopefully have learned to pass it on to their children Right, mm -hmm. the the whole seven generations thing, but it's living and being. It's not just talking about Nishnami and claiming to know this. It's actually living that way and walking that talk, mm -hmm. and also reminding about how secret some of the things about who we are. How there's people out there that aren't ready for that, so we have to hold on to that. Mm -hmm. sometimes and not share it it's really the only thing I can think of yeah. to answer your question oh that's fine that's perfect mm -hmm. yeah. is there a story or a teaching that you can share with the listeners of this audio recording here I can remember a little girl who was taken away from her family and her community and sold into another nation's family and I remember that little girl being forced to learn religion et etiquette education and that little girl never had any ties to who they were Apart from one little book that was a children's storybook that was written in the language. And as that little girl grew up, still being forced to attend these institutions to learn, or church to experience religion, that this young person always knew that they didn't belong where they were. And nobody had told this young person that they were different, but this person always knew. And that young person, when they left that family, they stopped going to school. And they developed a hatred towards that way of life and being forced to, you must learn, you must learn, you must learn. <clears throat> but that young person learnt because they had that reminder of this little book that was written in the language that 
that was enough for this person, even though they were taken away from who they were, to shine that light of hope, that curiosity. Well, what do these words mean? Maybe I need to go and find out who I am and find my people and find my place in the world. So that young person did that. And in that journey to doing that, she learned a whole lot more than any education um, facility could teach her. But she also learned that she had to go back and finish school. Because at that, by that time, she understood that she'd have children one day. And she didn't want that cycle to repeat itself. She wanted to make sure that her children would go to school and have that tool to be able to exist in that world. But before they went to school, they would stay home. And they would learn how the mother had learned about finding out who she was and where she came from first. Hmm. Leading by example. You, could, uh, you never finished school, Mom. So I'm not going to school. Well, no, there was more to it than that. It was learning about who we were. And it was that one little shred of language that was written in a book that reignited that spirit to find out you know, who am I? Where is my place in this world? That education. To be able to sit here and talk to you and answer these horrible questions. Because <laughs> that's me, obviously. But that's the story I wanted to share with you. If there's anything, no matter how small, in any of the information that I gave you about education in regards to being Anishinaabe, I hope it reaches you. Or I hope it reaches that person who might be reading or listening. But to also understand that we have that responsibility once we find out who we are, the ones that come after, we have to let them know. And it's okay to pick up those other tools as long as we know who we are first. And I live and breathe that. My youngest one is six. Well, he'll be six soon. And he's still not in that Western school system. He's at home. And that young boy can probably name 17 different trees by its bark alone. And he, can, he knows when the fish run. And he knows when he can harvest certain medicines. And he knows how to take care of each other. And he knows how to use his voice. And now he's ready to enter that Western education system. Thanks again for your sharings. Oh my gosh. You learn something new every day. <laughs> That's the truth, I think. Uh -huh. Our third question. Yep. What then is your vision for Anishinaabe education over the next 10 years? What I would like to see is as long as there's laws that dictate to us about having to be in education facilities. Those laws would definitely need to change. But what does that change look like to answer the question? I like that individual educational institutes are moving and growing and finding ways to accept and adapt some of the daily happenings that happen within Anishinaabek homes and finding a way to model it into some other curriculum or to understand and excuse them from class instead of being absent because they are starting to become aware of how important these things are. Mm -hmm. For Anishinaabe education, of course, learning that Western tool, but it has to start somewhere. So instead of those years that we go to, let's call it kindergarten, no, we have to listen to the child, right? Is the child ready to go to kindergarten, right? But instead of calling it kindergarten, um, I would like to see our young people 
go to school the whole year, but not every day, but be there for things like we're going to go learn about why and how this app is running now. We're going to learn how we used to collect it. We're going to collect it. We're going to harvest it. We're going to learn how to turn it into and that being a mark, a degree, <laughs> whatever you want to call it, right? And then when the next thing comes along in the season that we would do as Anishinaabe people mm -hmm. to be credited for learning about that, you know? I have children who have been recently excused from school, which is great because it's been a long 20-year fight to get institutions to understand that they should not be marked absent because they're going out to learn how to snare rabbits because as young men it's their responsibility to help provide food for their family. Mm. Right? So even learning things like that to be accredited towards because it builds that connection with everything that's out there in creation and with ourselves mm -hmm. and somehow find a way to mesh that core foundation with some of the things that they might need to learn according to what they what vision they have for their life mm -hmm. right so my one child wants to be a doctor great she's going to that western school great but at what point does the seven years of learning about gathering and harvesting medicines that's worked for our people for ever what, where does that play in her doctor degree? Mm -hmm. No, she has to prescribe. Penicillin instead. Well, no, let's try and put this. Oh, so our only registered healers and in institutions are allowed to do that. I, so, so could I... Uh, is it as easy to say you want to... You're currently breaking down... The system that's in place, you want to make sure it's inclusive to our, uh, our ways? I, I could break it down because it hasn't worked. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's the thing. <laughs> you right? know, we even the most successful Anishinaabe person out there right now with seven different university degrees is still out there searching and trying to find something about themselves because they didn't pick it up. Mm hmm when they were younger. That system out there is broken. And I know that. That's why I kept my youngest home. It took me that long to figure out that I'm tired of fighting a system that's broken. Mm -hmm. It's being governed by up instead of down. And it's not creating that relationship with the ones who have to go there. Mm -hmm. And that could be any race. You know, I've seen other races get the bad end of the stick <laughs> right. when it comes to education and having to go to bat for those other races when I see that this dictatorship of education isn't working for that individual person I would break it all down I would restart all over again right. I mean the easy answer is let Anishinaabe people have their own schools and teach the way they want and be accepted and accredited to okay great but you're missing the prophecies and the teachings of our elders that said we were going to have to learn some of these tools to meet them on their level. Mm. Yeah. So there's Aboriginal education strategy going on right now. Yay! Everyone's all happy. Yay! Great! But which one of you is well enough and carry the knowledge to be able to teach our young? And nobody's head goes up. Is that, is that something you can address in a 10-year period? If there was enough people on the same page and we weren't still all divided because of history, we have the power to be able to change things mm -hmm. within days. But because we are still a nation like others that have been wounded so much from that intervention, it will take longer. We have elected chiefs 
that are trying to advocate for certain things. And they've been in court proceedings for years. But that word elected chiefs following a Western model, which history has shown to us, doesn't work for our people. So the cycle just keeps going round and round and round and round. Until we find out who we are and learn about Anishinaabek education or Cree or what is, wherever you're from. Mm-hmm. and become strong in those core values and begin to understand how important it is that we know who we are and then stand together in unity. You're not going to see uh, a lot of viable changes in your 10-year period. Mm-hmm. You know, one of my elders is 96 years old and he's still rolling, saying, oh my gosh, are they still discussing that? Mm-hmm. Haven't they changed it yet? Any last, any last point? to talk about your vision for the next 10 years? I'm leaning really close to just uh, moving my family back to the bush and living there and off the land because I'm about done with the way the current Western system is conducting themselves and imposing on us. I'm getting tired. I'm getting Mm. tired of fighting them. I know that if I ever went to the bush, I'm not giving up, but I'm going to be having a better quality of life for the ones in my immediate circle, and they'll carry on knowing what it is and how we're supposed to be.